Jays. I'm going to try to work just without the microphone. Can you hear me okay? Great, because I don't want to stand over there. I want to stand over here. So this topic is extremely, it's a little embarrassing in its simplicity. Right? It's not something that's, that anybody could see in a lot, like a lot of the methodology. You know, the most interesting findings often are those right in front of us that we never really recognize or notice until we do. And then we go, oh my God, they're all over the place, right? And it relates to this idea of the customer is always right, except unless the customer is black. And the phrase the customer is always right goes back to 1901, a gentleman named Harry Gordon Selfridge who revolutionized the way in which um, department stores and shopping were done, okay? And the idea of the customer always is right is in many ways obviously wrong, right? I mean, the customer is, anybody ever worked in retail before? You've had that customer, you know who it is, who was not right. And in fact, um, I convened a group discussion with a friend of mine uh, with people in the customer experience field to talk with them about is the customer always right? And if you're interested in reading about it, I blogged on it on my consulting website, ethnoanalytics.com. We also recorded a podcast on it. And one of the findings from this discussion with these people, these executives, was that one of the things that makes a customer not right is if they're really difficult. If they are problematic in any kind of way that can negate their status as being customer. Okay? The idea that being a customer while privileged status infers certain rights and responsibilities of that customer to behave in a certain kind of way. On a sliding scale, if you have a customer that's really, really high pain, you're going to put up with a little bit more or a lot more versus other customers which you know, are not as valuable. And so this, th th this paper or this presentation is about simply how is a person seeable as being a customer. When I well, going forward on this, the simple definition of customer, just you know, doing what my students do and Googling that, would produce a person or organization that buys goods or services from a store or business. So it's a, it's a status that exists through action. You go to do something or intend to do something, you automatically possess this category, the status as being customer. On my LinkedIn, I went and asked the question, you know, I need some feedback for a presentation coming up. How would you define what is a customer? And I got a range of responses from people I know in my LinkedIn network. Some very simple, a person who wants or requires a service or a product to provide, to a lot more complex. And these are all people who are in customer experience, which I'll explain what that is in a second, and do a range of customer service. And I really like this one. There actually can be several actors who are customers at the same time. An example based upon my worldview is one in which a lessor of a commercial machine has bundled a, for a lessee a multi-year service contract that is performed by a third-party service provider. You're starting to see it's a little more complicated than that at the very end, and it can get complicated. True. It can get real complicated in terms of who is the customer and how is a person seeable as being a customer, and more importantly for the purposes of this talk, how they're treated or not as a customer. So the idea of a customer is, is, is while simple, it's problematic. And for instance, you know, bathroom is for customers only. You can see signs that show preferential status <laughs> only if you are seen or act as a customer. And even that can get complicated. Who spends six dollars or more? I don't know if it's five dollars and forty-five cents, if there's any kind of sliding scale, if it's a hard stop, if you have to produce receipts or evidence of having spent that much money. But things like bathrooms are not just for anybody. For any person, the person has to be recognizable as that kind of person who has access by virtue of their privilege of being a customer. This talk is related off the dissertation research I did many years ago in the 1990s in Arab-owned liquor stores in metropolitan Detroit. It involved a six-year study in which I interviewed numerous people, worked in stores, videotaped the interactions at the counters of the stores. And one of the things that was very interesting during that time, and I didn't do a lot with, was how people would infer status of being a customer. One emblematic piece that I've, that I've uh, talked about is where a man wants change for a $50 bill in the form of two 20s, a five, and five ones. And the, the worker cannot give the five ones, 
and the customer says, heck, I just spent $5, I just spent $5 with you. Not only saying you should have money, but I am a customer, inferring that status of, I spent money here, therefore you should treat me in a particular kind of way. This was an African American customer and a Arab liquor store owner. And it did start to define how relationships are built across the counter in these stores, but also destroyed across the counter as well in these interactional moments. Currently, I've been doing this research project on CX professionals, customer experience professionals, working through, not employed by, but facilitating my research through the Customer Experience Professionals Association, also attending a range of industry events, also myself putting on events for people in the industry and blogging and contributing to ongoing discussions on LinkedIn and various other kinds of uh, web, web forums. And the idea here is to understand what is this thing of customer experience, right? And how, how does sociology and social science fit within it? Simply put, customer experience is the totality of business operations, processes, and practices that can directly and indirectly impact the experience of the customer. So it's everything. If you think about this conference, customer experience can extend from when you left your home to come here, to getting your badge, to attending conferences, to bathrooms, to everything, to the app, all, the totality of everything that you've experienced. The focus is on this idea of the voice of the customer understanding who the customer is from their own perspective and their own words. And designing those experiences with the customer in mind, especially in terms of empathy. I want to hook on that term here for a second, because it's the issue of empathy, which right now in experience design, which is really central. Understanding the feelings, the position, the sentiment of your customers, users, patients, employees, etc. But as we'll talk about, what if you can't have empathy with the person because you don't identify them as like you, but other? And furthermore, not as customer, but somebody else. So on the spectrum from other to alike, we can situate it as an us versus them kind of proposition. This is something that I developed called pronoun progression where in my, dis my dissertation work, see, and also work on software development teams, when people position themselves as us and them with great social distance, the likelihood for interpreting simple everyday acts, as Anne talked about, as being suspect, dangerous, problematic, need of correction, increases, versus if people see themselves as alike, that social distance decreases, the ability to work together increases because, in no small part, the ability to give the benefit of the doubt for any kind of act that's done, no matter how objectionable, exists, which facilitates smoother interactions. Right? Versus simple acts, like sitting on a front porch, becoming problematic. Here, problematic acts can be simplified because of the alignment between people. I'm linking this to Garfinkel's Conditions of a Successful Degradation Ceremony, where he says, any communicative work between persons whereby the public identity of an actor is transformed into something looked on as lower in the social scheme of social types will be called Status Degradation Ceremony. 2008, Paul Jobert and I published a paper called Undoing Degradation, where we looked at how Arabs and Muslims try to present themselves just like everybody else. They were degraded in the public consciousness, and so they tried to do things like, you know, we're American, and we're Muslims, you know, not exclusive categories. Uh, we can't be Americans because we're Muslims. You know, we pay taxes, we're professionals, we vote, we have families. You've heard similar things, I'm sure, people express to demonstrate or undo the degradation that they experience, the lowering of their social status through connecting with everyday practices. And this leads to questioning this idea of what is a customer, and how a customer is not something just related to practice, but related to how you're seen and perceived by others, and how race and other things like being a gay couple can negate that status of being a customer. And I say in a blog that I wrote on my blog site, customers can not only be lost, they can be unmade in the course of one interaction, one encounter. Conversely, customers can be made through interactions as well. 
interact. So this customer is not a status that you automatically possess by virtue of what you do. It's a status that you are given on how sealable you are as fitting into that category, that membership category of customer. And so for the data collection, the data collection was relatively simple, unfortunately simple. I was looking online every day and finding all these examples of customers not being treated as customers while doing customer things. And it's the very act of doing those simple customer things that were treated as inherently problematic. And the resource for a complaint by those who were workers on denying the status of being a customer for the person who's African American or black, or identifiably African American or black. And using cell phone video footage that was filmed by people involved in these encounters. So I just want to walk through a few of them. You know, one involving a hateful turn involving a pizza. And maybe these are things that you've you know, you've heard about. <clears throat> this was in Domino's Pizza in Florida. I'm not going to read through all of it, obviously, but a man ordered a pizza. Um, he didn't get the pizza delivered in time. He called the store. An employee named Amy apologized and told him she would send his order to the correct location and give him 50% off for the trouble. One might say good customer experience. Apologizing, correcting, not just correcting, but also giving him something to make up for the problem. However, after two hours of waiting, the food still hadn't showed up. So he went to the store with his daughters to pick up the food. When he arrived at Domino's, Robinson claims the manager was unwilling to honor the discount he had been promised from the other location, and things go downhill from there. And this, I'm not going to play the video, but the video is available online. The customer says, Nah, you're the manager, I'm the customer. Act accordingly. I ain't your friend. You don't talk to me like that invoking, I have this status of being a customer, therefore I should be treated a certain way. I'm not under the category of your friend, which would involve or invoke certain other kinds of commitments on the part of the worker. There's a privilege position of being a customer that infers certain kinds of customer treatment. <clears throat> well, you don't talk to other people like that. I want to draw your attention to this idea of people here. It's not, well, you don't talk to employees like that or workers like that. You see the worker here taking the foundation of being a customer away from him and reducing it to people. Leveling the interactional playing field, so to speak, where the customer status has now been degraded to just people. All right? Why? Why not? I'm the customer. I'm mad. Once again, re-invoking, I am the customer, not just people. I don't care who you are. Final rejection of it. And it actually gets worse because that we'll see other categories are inferred as well. The man's lawyer, we want to bring this to light to let businesses know it's not okay to treat customers like this. So once again, bringing it back up. It's not just people having a conflict, it's customers and workers. Amplifying the mistreatment of the customer. And it's never okay to use the N-word. So that's a good lesson to learn there as well from the lawyer. More membership categories. He is a father of two. He works two full-time jobs. He's a volunteer football coach. This was in the news account that was created. I'm running out of time here. I want to hit on some more of these things. Like I said, it's very simple what I'm trying to describe here. Members of a group say they were chatting in the parking lot with their to-go boxes when police rolled up and said the restaurant manager wanted them gone and they didn't need to give a reason. They're, just bought food in Chili's, hanging out in the parking lot talking. The police are called to remove them for being people talking in the parking lot. This is a rather longer video, but I pulled out some of the highlights. Gentlemen right here, I spent my money here. Status of customer. Police officer trying to say why it's okay that they can be kicked out of the parking lot. Let's say you own a business, okay? And there are people, not customers, People, once again, negating the status of customer, who are on your business property, regardless of race, sex, whatever it may be. Exactly, exactly, regardless of what it is, okay? If you have a problem with that group of people, not group of customers, which you can imagine would make the, the claim more complicated, right? If the police officer says here, you know, you have a group of customers and your business, that's a tough one, versus group of people, which invokes a lower status 
and actually the indexicality of people, what kinds of people are we talking about, right? Which is another layer of analysis that we could go into. You have every single right to have them removed, and you can call me. Another member of the party, why would you have a problem with somebody that paid service? But why would you have a problem with somebody that paid service? All we did was pay and leave. Once again, re-invoking that status. Last one, it just happened. Student accuses Santa Fe store clerk of racial profiling after police called. Keep in mind the word accuses here. They said I was sketchy because I picked stuff up, put stuff back. Which is what a customer does. A customer can pick stuff up, look at it, and put it back. That very same act is treated as problematic because of why? Because he's being arrogant, because he's black. I want to thank her for saving us the trouble of how trying to infer her motivation here. That's helpful. It's like, thank you for saying what you really meant. So this is problematic, not because he's a customer, but because he's not a customer in black. And so the upshot of this to finalize, the social deconstruction of being a customer. Customers can be made and unmade during the course of an encounter. Evidence and membership categories used and inferred mundane acts take on different significances when performed by those who are not seen as congruent with the membership category. You're not customer, you're black. Race can be treated as a breach in customer service encounters. What did the customers do to result in this treatment? They were black. And that's it. And no longer seen as legitimate, but as suspect. And as with any degradation ceremony, the degradation can be challenged through reference to practice and reclaiming of status. And this is what, we, when we looked at the degradation ceremony of, of uh, Arabs and Muslims, it was in printed material in the media in which people were invoking status of being like everybody else. Here we have interactionally in that moment where the worker is denying status of customer by virtue of the customer doing nothing other than being customer, right? That the customers re-invoke their status. And sometimes other statuses as well. There's one I didn't go into where a man was talking about how much money he makes and how much money he's spending. This was a Sausalito where his daughter, they were kicked out because his daughters were trying on clothes. Customer stuff. But the very act of customer stuff when viewed through the lens of race in everyday life, becomes not customer stuff, it becomes other stuff, and other stuff that's not privileged in the same kind of way. And the thing that really comes to my mind here is the, <laughs> right, well there we go, right? Um, the social and psychic and psychological weight of having to argue for status that is assumed that other people just possess, that's actively taken away and is not readily, that is not seen but readily visible. By that I mean this. How do you make visible that which is there to be seen but is now ignored because of who you are? How can you unbreach a situation when the breach lies in your skin color? And I should also say that in every instance I put here, um, people were fired and corporations gave out statements about how sorry they were, which is a whole other topic. But the idea of how customers are made and unmade in the course of interaction around everyday racism and everyday life and the awareness we need to have for those particular elements of taking for granted categories to really surface how racism acts in tacit and unconscious ways. Thank you.